we have a lot of verses to cover now, so we're going to have to move right along. We're thankful again uh, for this opportunity to come together to open your word and to see the wonderful things that you have for us. I pray you'll anoint your word as it goes out. Anoint my voice, my lips to say those things that you'd have said. And then anoint our hearts to receive. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alright. We're now in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. <clears throat> beginning with verse 1. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, It is because of Saul in his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. <clears throat> so the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Now we don't know when this famine took place. Uh, some say it happened earlier in David's reign, and they cite the fact that some of the stuff that we're going to read here, uh, David wouldn't wait, for instance, we're going to move the bones of Saul. He wouldn't wait it that long. But I don't necessarily hold with that, because uh, you know he could have waited 50 years to move, or 40 years, or 30 years, whatever it was, uh, to move Saul from where he was. You know, uh, So, so there, there isn't really any, any time frame. And we do know a lot of these events didn't happen just in linear order. Some of them were, you know, and we're going to see here in a minute about the giants and things. These could have happened at any time during David's reign. Um, so we don't really have any proof of anything that dictates it happened one event after the other. However, uh, I, tend, I tend personally to feel, uh, going through this part of it anyway, that these may have been events that happened pretty much the way chronologically that they're in here. Uh, I, you know, I can present my side just as well as anybody else can, I guess, so, you know, it's, it's kind of up to whatever. And it's completely irrelevant. It really is. It's completely irrelevant. These events happen. Where did they happen? Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> but we see this, uh, that there was all of a sudden there was a famine, or a famine in the land. And so David, and why he waited three years, uh, we don't know unless he probably maybe thought, well, the first two years was just kind of natural, you know, it was a cycle, maybe just didn't have enough rain. But after the third year, he decided he better go talk to the Ulm and Thurum. So he got to the high place and, uh, and inquired of the Lord, and he found out it was because of Saul and how bloodthirsty Saul had been in trying to kill or run off the Gibeonites. Now, Gibeon was a large city in the territory of Benjamin, and it was, it was inhabited by the, uh, the, Hav the Hevites. Now, the Hevites uh, were a uh, tribe or, or a nation or a group of people that was in Canaan when Joshua came in. So these were some of the original inhabitants of Canaan. Uh, so they had this, uh, uh, well, Let's go back. When Joshua came in to the, to the land, across the Jordan River, of course they, they immediately destroyed Jericho and they destroyed, they destroyed Ai, you remember? And, and so they were marching down the road and Gibeon wasn't far in front of them. It was about a three day journey. So the Gibeonites decided what they would do is they would trick Joshua. So they sent ambassadors to Joshua and <laughs> when you read the story it's, it's really interesting. It's in 1 Chronicles. They, they, they actually put on old clothes, they took on, put on old ratty sandals, they took their wine cask, got the oldest beat up, stitched up wine casks they could find. They got bread that was old and moldy, and they put all this on, and they went to see the, uh, Joshua. And they said, we're from a far country. So when they looked at them, their clothes were ratty, you know, their wine casks were all tore up, their food. They had come a long distance to come to Joshua. And they said, we want to make peace. We want to make a covenant with you. Because we're from a far country. And so Joshua made the covenant with them. And said, we will, you know, 
We will not go to war. We will not kill you off. We're going to let you be. And uh, that was fine until Joshua found out there were only three days' journey. So he took the army and he went over to the Gibeonites. But, but, in, but instead of killing them, instead of just wiping them out, which is what God accidentally command, commanded him to do, he realized and understood he had made a covenant with them. And so that covenant, and it, this is kind of interesting, but the covenants that we make can actually overshadow, take the place of God's will. And in some places, in this case, God's commandment. He said, go in and wipe them all out. Joshua made a covenant. And so he could not kill the Gibeonites. So what they did, what he did was, he just, he just cursed them. And he said, you are going to be the, uh, the uh, woodcutters and the water bearers for the nation of Israel. And this may have come from an earlier uh, pronouncement that was put on the, uh, uh, it wasn't the Hevites, but it was the Amorites, anyway, that they would be woodcutters and, and water bearers. So maybe that's where he got the idea. Moses put that curse on them. So anyway, this is kind of where, where we are. Now, Saul evidently decided that he could negate the, um, the covenant that Joshua had made because God had commanded to wipe them out. So what Saul was evidently doing is saying, well, the word of God overcomes the covenant. And so he would evidently, and this is not a recorded event. We don't find it anywhere in Scripture except here, and of course in Chronicles where it's the same story is related in a little more detail. Uh, but evidently, uh, Saul decided to, to go and kill them all off and run them all off, which was a violation of the covenant. And so now, here we are years later, and God is causing a famine on the land of Israel because Saul violated a covenant that Joshua had made that was in exact opposition to the word of God and commandments of God. That's interesting. And I think it tells us a little bit more about God that we can uh, actually <laughs> violate the word of God by our covenants and by agreements that we make. Even though they may be completely contrary to what God has commanded, he will honor those if they're made in his name because now they become his. And that's what Joshua did. I think it's a note of warning that we'd be very careful about agreements and contracts and whatever that we make. Uh, now that was, by the way, that was in Exodus 32, or 23, I'm sorry, Exodus 23 and 22 and Deuteronomy 7 and 2, uh, which, for, which, in which it did, it forbid Israel from making any covenants with the inhabitants of Cana as an excuse to violate the oath made by Joshua. All right. <clears throat> so in order to regain the blessing of God, David called the Gibeonites and asked what he could do to repair the wrong. Uh, now, it's interesting. David didn't ask God. David asked God what was wrong. When he found out what was wrong, he asked the Gibeonites how to solve it. Mm -hmm. Seems a little strange, doesn't it? That's what he did. All right, let's go on. Verse 3. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they, then they answered the king, As for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord and give all give of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. Now, 
it, it's uh, it's interesting here and a little dangerous that Saul, uh, that David rather, asked him, so what, do you, what do you want me to do for you so that you can bless Israel? Now he didn't expect them to literally go out and say, I bless Israel. What he was referring to is that because there was this violation of the oath, God had shut up the rain and it was famine. So they would bless Israel by making or giving the, 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 uh, uh, the requirements that they would forgive Israel or would you know, show uh, kindness to Israel, that would cause God then to lift the curse. And so it wasn't that they were literally going to do anything other than saying, if you do this, then that takes care of, of, our, of, our, uh, of your, uh, uh, what you owe us, of your debt. Uh, it's also interesting that they refused any money. In those days, you could buy things. You know, if, uh, for instance, if you are if you had a son who murdered somebody else, you could go over and offer money, and that would recompense the, uh, the offense. And so that was a very common practice in those days, was to actually buy uh, forgiveness, I guess is what, what you could say. They didn't want any of Saul's money. They didn't want any money that Saul had anything to do with. Now, as you're reading this, I hope you begin to see they didn't like Saul. <laughs> they didn't like Saul at all. Now, they knew that Israel was not to blame. It was only Saul and his descendants. Now, it's interesting also, he makes a, they make a statement in here in verse 4, We shall have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. Well, they say that, then they're going to turn right around and demand seven. <laughs> but I think what we're seeing here is they're saying, we don't want you to just pull somebody out of Israel. We don't want you to go get a, uh, you know, a Joab or somebody, uh, you know, a really high person. Because they're in Israel, it wasn't their fault. So they were, in effect, taking De uh, Saul out of Israel. They're not even recognizing Saul and his descendants, his house, as being a part of Israel. Okay? That's how much they hated this man for what he had done. So whatever he did was not a little thing. It was a big thing. And then David said, well, whatever you want, just let me know. That's a dangerous approach. You remember, <laughs> you remember what happened when, when uh, 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 Herod made that statement. Oh, well, whatever you want to half of my kingdom, and he, he ended up with John's head on a, on a tray, you know. Uh, so, so it's always dangerous when you leave those kinds of statements open like that because that was a promise, and he had to abide by what he said. So they said, okay, we want seven of Saul's sons. Well, we know there was no sons of Saul left. They'd all been killed. So again, we're going back to um, this thing in Scripture, and we're going to see more about it in a little bit here where a son could mean a grandson, great-grandson, anywhere down the lineage. So we want some of the lineage, the male, seven of them. And we're going to take them to Gabal, and we're going to hang them. <laughs> so David said, okay, you got it. Verse 7, But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rezpah, the daughter of Ai, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel and the son, the son of Barcelia, the Mahalatha. Uh, and he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days in the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay. So, number one, David spared Mephibosheth. And again, this was an oath. So, if he had given them Mephibosheth, he would have been violating his own oath, which was made before God, and that would have brought more problems from God. Okay, so that so Mephibosheth was out of the way, and notice the men didn't specify who, so it was left up to David to decide who he wanted uh, to be put to death. 
So then he took Armoni and Mephibosheth, two sons of Respa. Now Respa uh, was one of Saul's concubines. So he took them. Then he took the five sons of Michael. But here we have a problem because Michael never had any children, according to uh, 2 Samuel 6 and 23. So who was this? <laughs> also, she was never married to this uh, Adriel. Actually, and this is another one of those problems with, with Hebrew uh, language, it was her sister. Now, some scholars think that probably something had happened to her sister, and so Michael raised these boys, because it does say in here who were born to uh, the Adriel guy. But it was not her husband. She was married to somebody else beside David. So these were kids that were her nephews, and she had probably raised them. Second Chronicles gives us uh, the picture when it says he, that it was the sister of Michael, so we know her. Remember when we were going through the part of Saul back there in 1 Samuel? Uh, you know, he would hold court up there under this tree on a hill overlooking Gabal. Mm -hmm. So this is probably the same hill. What they were doing was, was you know, you might say rubbing his face in it, as we would put it today. He could have been in Saul's hometown where he spent most of his time on the hill. All of these people coming, you know, and this was his glory. And here is his offspring being killed and hung up until the famine is lifted. Wow. These guys hated him. I mean, that's the best you can say. <clears throat> All right, now notice this. They make, he makes the, the writer here makes an interesting statement. It says it was in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. What does that tell us about it? This would have been in April. Uh, right at the beginning of the, the hot season, of the real hot season, but it would be very, very hot over there. So these corpses were going to sit up there until it rained. And, uh, you know, after a few days in the heat, you know what that must have been like. Ten. Now, Respa, the daughter of um, Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, uh, <clears throat> nor the beasts of the field by night. And David was told what Rezpah, the daughter of Ea, 
the concubine of Saul had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Gabish Gilead, who had stolen them from the streets of Beth Shane, where the Philistines had hung him up after the Philistines had truck, struck down Saul and uh, Saul in Gaboa. So he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there, and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin and Zelah, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. Now, <clears throat> what Rispa did is she went out and put up a tent and on a rock, a flat place, she, she erected her tent and her and probably her sons, her servants, kept the birds from the, the vultures from getting to those bodies and the animals that would come out at night, she kept them all away for six months. Think about that. The rains that she's talking about, the early rains, came in October. So from April till October, about six months, she didn't do anything except keep the birds and the animals away from those corpses that were hanging out there. Now that's what you call devotion. That's what you call having determination. Sticking with it. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it no matter what. It was not a pleasant task. <laughs> not a pleasant task at all. But she did it. And it was during this time that David learned of the actions of Rizpah. And so, <clears throat> a lot of say, well, you know, this is why, why they say, well, why did, he, why did he wait that long? Well, I don't know why he waited that long, but it doesn't say it was the bodies of Saul. It was the bones. So they had been in the tomb long enough that they were no longer bodies. They were bones. And so probably a number of years had gone by. And so he sent the men down. They took the bodies of John, Jonathan and Saul from the men um, uh, that were down in... Uh, uh, Beth Shane, or no, Gibbish, Gilead. And you remember that story uh, was when uh, uh, the, the Philistines had, of course, killed Jonathan and Saul. They took their bodies to Beth Shane, took off their heads, and hung the corpses up on the wall inside the gates of Beth Shane. And these men from uh, Gibbish, Gibbish, Gilead snuck over, stole the bodies, and hid them and buried them in a tomb. So they honored their king by not allowing him to be uh, just, you know, made fun of out there hanging up. So David went down, got the bodies, the bones brought them back. Um, while Jonathan and Saul had been, of course, buried, they had not been buried uh, in their family tomb, probably in a very inconspicuous spot <clears throat> so the Philistines wouldn't know where to go pick, dig the bodies up or, you know, get them out of the tomb. <clears throat> so they needed to be honored in their family tomb, and so it was important that they get them. And, of course, all seven sons would be in the same tomb, same sepulcher, because they were the offspring of Saul. Uh, notice God did not uh, lift his curse until those two men... And the seven of seven of them, actually nine of them, had been buried in their father's tomb. All right, now uh, we're going to go to verse 15. Now we, we, what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of shift. We've learned about uh, lifting the curse from the land. Now we're going to talk about, uh, or the Bible is going to talk about how they got rid of the giants. Remember, that was a big thing when Joshua and the other spies came in to, uh, to spy out the land. Is the, the giants. They have giants out there. Huge men. And here, here we are, how many years later, and David 
uh, is, as far as we know, the one who finally eradicated the rest of the giants out of the land. He killed one of Goliath as a boy, but they were still there. And, but it seems that their numbers were slowly dwindling, whether that was because of, uh, uh, you know, the fact they're genetically problems and they were dying off, or, or they, they were all men of war, so maybe just the war attrition was taking them out. But we're going to find out how these five giants got killed. We're going to start off with the first one, verse 15. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, <coughs> David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishbi Binab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, that new sword thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go no more, uh, uh, you shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now, a lot of the commentaries say this happened early in David's reign when they were still uh, fighting the Philistines on a regular basis. Th there's a problem with that because he, David was not allowed to go out to war anymore by his, by his military leaders. But yet he went out to war after that. So that's another reason why I say this was toward the end of David's reign. Toward the, he was getting to be an older man. Um, you know, and I, I can attest to the fact that you, when you get old, you still think you can do things. And, you know, you can go out there and you can do it, you know. I can get out there and I can work like crazy for all of about five minutes. And then I'm looking around for a chair, you know. <coughs> and that's kind of what I see here with David. Battle. He had his sword. He was probably just battling away and all of a sudden, oh, I better go find a rock. You know. That's just age. It wears down on you. And so he was fighting, and whether he was fighting this giant or somebody else, probably the giant, but he could have been fighting somebody else. When he went to sit down, I mean, he had to get out of the battle someplace. And the giant decided, hey, I have an opportunity to kill David. And so there's a couple of things about this guy. Um, uh, the weight of his spearhead was about eight pounds, just the brass head uh, or, or spear uh, point on his spear. Now you can compare that to, to Goliath, and Goliath was exactly twice as big. So the spearhead on Goliath's spear was 16 pounds. If you can imagine taking a spear that's about 10 feet long, because these guys were big and they big spear, with, a, with an eight pound brass on it, you're gonna throw that at somebody. You know, I wouldn't even be able to pick it up at the end of a, you know, pick that thing up at least five feet hanging out there, and I'm going to do something with it. No. So he was a big man, to say the least. And you'll remember, uh, by the way, that um, when they came into the land, they killed Og. Og was the last of the giants for that tri that area of, the Can of Canaan, and his bed measured 13 feet 6 inches. So these were the size of these guys. These weren't just our giants that we have today are seven foot, seven and a half feet. These guys were giants. They were up there. So uh, anyway, Abishi had jumped in, killed this giant. And we'll notice too that this giant had a new sword. That's actually, uh, instead of sword, what was meant there was a new scabbard or gar girdle. And that was given as a sign of, uh, if you co were commissioned as an officer or you've got a new rank, you got a new scabbard. You know, in, the, in our time, and we put stripes on their sleeve or something to indicate that this is an officer or somebody in, increased in rank. This guy had just been made, had just been promoted to a new rank, and he had a new scabbard, a new sword. And uh, so that may have added to his zeal. You know, hey, I made this, so now I gotta prove my point that I'm really somebody. Anyway, Abishia got in. And, uh, and killed them off. Now, he said he was the son of that giant. Now, this could mean two things. Some feel that that giant is referring to Goliath. 
And I, I for one, uh, feel kind of that's maybe what it was all about. Because, number one, of his zeal to want to kill David, who David had killed Goliath, uh, that would have been, this means this may have been one of Goliath's sons or grandsons. Either one. And, uh, and so that would, that would lend some impetus into this whole thing. And if we look at it, we're wondering also why they were fighting in the first place over in, over in this place. Um, doesn't say where they went. We're going to find out in a minute uh, on the other ones that they were over in Philistine territory. Well, David had rid uh, that country of the Philistines pretty much. So this may have been an attempt by the Philistines to retake some of those cities. Because they didn't go away. They were still there. They just didn't have the military might. So this may have been an attempt and, and led by these giants. They had a champion here uh, to retake these cities. So I, I for one, kind of think it was, uh, it was Goliath. Others refer to a very prominent giant that lived in that day by the name of Rapha. The problem I have with that is Rapha is a name for giant. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, giants of those days were products of the sons of God, who the fallen angels, who came down and had relationships with the sons of, of man, the women, and from their offspring were giants. Now, take that or leave it, you know, that's, that's one of the interpretations of what that's all about. But that would account for these extraordinarily huge, huge men and the fact that they didn't last long. You know. Now, it is possible that the Raphim were literal giants, and Raphim is another name for this group. The Septuagint uses the Greek words gigas and titans, the source of the English titan, to translate verses. So the ancient Jews certainly considered them to be giants. They are described generally as being between 7 and 10 feet tall and are called mighty men. The Egyptians wrote about giants who lived in the land of Canaan, and the folklore of other nations is full of such references. The people of the ancient world accepted the presence of giants as a fact of history, and the Bible presents them as enemies who were destroyed either by the judgment of God or in battle with men. Uh, okay. Also, notice then when David became faint and uh, had to be rescued, his soldiers, you're not going to go anymore to battle with us. We want you to stay home, stay home lest you quench the lamp of Israel. And what was meant by the lamp of Israel? Well, the king, you remember, was anointed by the last living prophet. How can I always going to do it? By the last prophet, priest, and judge, Samuel. So he had, and he was, he prophesied. He was a prophetic king. And he, the lamp refers to his leadership, to his following God, and in turn leading the nation the way God wanted them to go. And of course we could go into, you know, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, um, type thing. But that's what they were referring to. You're going to be more good at home than you are out here. We can take care of ourselves. All right. Verse 18. Now it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Now Gob is one of the cities. Uh, it's um, right on the border of Benjamin and kind of Ephraim right in that area there. Then Sabachi, the Hushinite, killed Saf, who was one of the sons of the giant. Again there was a war at Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, Elhanan the son of Jerry Oregim, the Bethlehemite killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. <laughs> now, whether these battles followed close behind or not, we're not sure, but probably it was all in the same period of time. Now, it took place in the city of Gob, which is in the land of the Philistines. <clears throat> so they must have either been using that city as a place to raid into Israel, or... They were trying to retake the city. 
it's interesting here. We have no no history of this as, as far as the actual battle. So we don't know if David gathered all of Israel together or if it was a small group that he took out to, to do this battling. Uh, whatever it was, they had these battles. Now, Sabachi, the, the Hushathite, Hushath, according to uh, first, uh, first Chronicles chapter 27, verse 11, he was a captain in the army and had 24,000 men under him. So he wasn't just some soldier. He was, he was over 24,000 soldiers. He would call him a general today. You know, that would be where he would be. Um, and he was also one of David's mighty men. Then there was the other bottle, like Gob. Uh, uh, Elhanan killed the brother of Goliath. So we have two of Goliath's sons dead, uh, or of this man, whatever, and now we have Goliath's brother being killed. Now this name Saf is Beth Halashmi or Lami in First Corinthians or First Chronicles, rather, chapter twenty, verse five. So again, two names, and as we found so many times, that's not unusual. Some of them had many names they went by, and it all depends on how you look at the Hebrew wording. Some of it. Uh, but he had a, a his his spear was the size size of a, of a weaver's beam, which would be about ten the looms that they're referring to in those days. So this was a, a pretty hefty spear. All right, verse twenty. Yet was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty four in number. And he also, he also was born to the giant. So he was another one of the born to the giant bunch. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemia, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. I find it interesting that this same guy defied Israel by uh, the God of Israel just like Goliath did. Only instead of the big story of Goliath and or of David and his slingshot, it just says this guy went out and killed him. <laughs> I just love the way that's kind of an offhand comment. He just went out and killed him. No big deal. Uh, because he had God with him. <clears throat> uh, nothing is known about this giant, by the way. Now Jonathan was the son of Shimei, who was the third son of Jesse, and David's uh, Jesse, who, and he was David's brother's son, or his nephew, if you will. All right, now we're going to go into chapter 22, and this is lengthy. There's 51 verses in here, uh, so we're going to kind of group them and go through it very quickly. This is almost an exact word for word. Uh, as the 18th Psalm. You can open Psalms 18 and you'll find exactly the same words. A few things added, maybe a few words here or there are different. Basically it is exactly the same Psalm. So when we covered Psalms, we covered this one. <laughs> but but Lucy, you, 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 and, uh, uh, you, know, you guys can hang in there and we'll go over it again. <laughs> I'm sure you remember verse, uh, verbatim, right? Alright, 2 Samuel verse 22. Uh, chapter 22, verse 1. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this psalm. On the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The Lord is my strength in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Now, this was probably written, uh, in fact, it's almost a, a surety that this was written at the end of David's life. He's come to 
Uh, in fact, some uh, feel this was probably the last psalm that David wrote. <clears throat> so it's included in two places. It's included here, and it was also include, included in the psaltery when they put the psalms together. Now the main mention of deliverance from Saul would signal the beginning of his reign and so should be taken as a timepiece for this composition. So David, is what he's doing is he's saying, you've delivered me from all of my enemies and from Saul. So he's taking Saul as being the start of all of his deliverance. He's not including Goliath, he's not including the lion and the bear and all that happened when he was younger. This all happened after he was anointed king. Also notice something, and I think this is important for us today to note. David, he didn't write this for somebody else to read. David spoke to the Lord the words of the psalm. I think part of the problem we have today with so much of the music in contemporary, contemporary worship music is it's not written to the Lord. It's written to man. When you look at some of the old hymns, for instance, that have been around for hundreds of years, and we sing them, and you know, and and uh, you know, you get things like "It is well with my soul." You know, though billows roll and troubles come, you are the one that delivered me. It's written to God. It's an ode. It's a song to God. And yet, so many others is you know, uh, well, I'm going to dance, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, and uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying, if we want to get the real essence of, of the blessings of God, I think we need to open our mouth, say it, number one, and say it to God, not to each other. I hear people, so, you know, praying. Now, I've always had a problem praying in public. You know, he may not think all that, but I always have. I, you know, I, I have this thing in my head. I said, oh, somebody's going to think if this makes any sense. <laughs> just kicks there, you know. And it used to really hinder me. Until I came to the conclusion, you know, I don't really care. If I get up and mumbly gook all over the place, that's no, that's no problem. I'm talking to God, and you know, I'll talk in tongues, and they can't understand anything anyway. <laughs> but too many people refuse to pray, or they don't want to pray because they don't think they can say it right. I got news for you: God doesn't really care. <laughs> say it however it comes out, but say it to Him, and don't worry about what anybody else thinks. That's what he says. That's what he wants. And notice these beautiful words. Uh, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. He's saying, the master, the ruler. The ruler, the master. It's who I put my trust in. It's who I serve. He is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. The God of my strength. In Him I'm going to put my trust. He has provided a shield for me. Protection. You know, and this is His whole, his whole way of thinking of, of, of addressing God uh, all the way through here. God was His strength, His hiding place, a place of defense, His rescuer, His shield, His method of salvation, and inacceptable hiding place. Nobody could get to where God hid him. Oh, I could go on. I've got to go on. David would call on the Lord who was worthy to be praised at all times and for all his needs. Why? So that he would be delivered from his enemies. God is worthy to be praised because he is faithful to deliver and provide when we call on him. You know, we sometimes, you know, and, and, and I understand the reasoning. We call on the Lord and worship, and because of our calling on the Lord and worship, God is going to deliver us. And then, you know, but we have this, some people have this elevated idea that if we call on the Lord for the purpose of deliverance, it doesn't work. We have to call on the Lord because we just want to, and then He will deliver us. That's not what David is saying here. He worshiped the Lord on purpose so that he could obtain deliverance. And, and, you know, when you think about it, why do we worship the Lord? Why do we even go to church? 
Why do we serve God? What's the purpose? Isn't it for deliverance? Don't we serve Him so that one day we're going to escape this place? Isn't that why we serve the Lord? Really? And so it's not, it's not this you know, demeaning idea that we serve God to get His blessings at all. It's what we're here for. That's what we do. Because He wants us wants us to receive his blessings. Anyway, we can get into that some other time. Verse 5. When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. When David was in great danger, he was afraid he'd be killed. He could feel the pangs of death. He called upon the Lord. David called on Jehovah for help and appealed to his ruler and judge for help. That word Lord, it means ruler. One of the other ones is judge. There's a whole list of them. You can pick out just about anything you want. <clears throat> but I think in this case, David was saying, I, I, I appeal to the Lord. He's the ruler. He's the judge. If I am guilty and need to die, okay. But if I'm innocent and I don't deserve death, then deliver me. Notice he called out with his voice. And God heard his voice with his ears. Now, if you don't think God's got good ears, and heard people make, make the, so, you know, sometimes we make the silliest statements, you know, we say, well, I've been praying, but God just didn't hear me. God's got awful good ears. This word temple, and of course they didn't have a well-developed idea of heaven or uh, you know the afterlife uh, in the days of David because they didn't have any scriptures and they didn't, you know, other than the first five books. <clears throat> and then they were not really that well disseminated. Uh, but <laughs> he's saying, God heard me from his tabernacle, from the heavenlies, from where he resides. His ear was good enough to hear my voice. So, yeah, God always hears. Verse 8, Then the earth shook, and the foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken. Because he was angry, smoke went out from his nostrils and a devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherubim and flew and he was seen upon the winds of the wing of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. Wow. In case, in case you don't think David had a way with words. Now he never saw any of this. I mean, you know, he never saw actually God you know, coming down, you know, on riding on a cherubim. So this is all figurative speaking. It's all similitudes. It's drawing a, a mental picture of what God was doing. The power the authority of God. Now having said that, <laughs> having said that, it is almost an exact picture of what we see in the book of Revelation when the Messiah comes back and ends the Gentile age. And we're going to cover that in course when we start here in a couple of weeks. So what David saw as figurative and similitudes 
is almost an exact picture of when God comes. He's coming on a white horse. He's breathing fire. He He's stomping, and, and, and the earth is going to quake, and, and we see all these things. Now, this also could have a reference uh, to two other things, <clears throat> which was the original earth. If, if you're a pre Adamic, if you go with the pre Adamic theory, uh, which is that God created the earth, and then there was some period of time, and He destroyed it, and our one, uh, one and two is the recreation of the earth. Uh, it, that's what explained dinosaurs and the things that, you know, we, we can no longer say they don't exist. I mean, they're in the museum. So, I mean, that's silly. You know, we still have some Christians that don't think we went to the moon. But, uh, you know, the point, the, the point here, uh, if you accept that theory, then this would, this would also be a, a, a great example of how God may have destroyed the original earth, uh, as far as wiping it out. Also, the flood. Again, we see very similar things here to the flood, although the fire was maybe not uh, that part of it, but you know, you could in your mind's eye see. But the one thing it does certainly do is show us the might and power of God. And notice the one thing on there, because he was angry. Don't get God angry. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. I don't want to fall into this God's hands. Wow, look at the power he puts out. Verse 17, He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me. Because he delighted in me. So David says, here's the fierceness of the anger of God. Earthquakes and fire and lightning and all of this stuff. Hailstorms. And he, you know, we, we, can, we can take this and drive it out into all kinds of examples of what happened in the Bible. And then the very next section. You see something entirely different. This same God, all of a sudden, He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out. Like you would pick up a baby. He drew me out. He delivered me from my strong enemy because I didn't have the strength to deliver myself. Oh, what a beautiful picture of God. He's angry. He's angry with this world. He's been angry with this world since, since the Garden of Eden. He has fire. He has power. He can come down and just destroy the whole thing today. And yet in His mercy, He reaches down and He picks up those people, those ones that He is delighted with. He didn't pick up David because his name began with a D or his father was Jesse, or even that he was the king. It was because God delighted in him. If we want to escape the vengeance of God, and we want to see the love of God, and we want to see the mercy of God, and the salvation of God, we have to put ourselves in a place of being delighted to God, or delighting to God. Whew. Verse 21. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, He has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all His judgments were before me, and as for His statutes, I did not depart from them. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. 
What an egocentric statement this is. Why God has done this because look at me, I am righteous and clean. You know, that's the way we would judge David if he walked in here today and said that, wouldn't we? We would. We'd say, what? What? Man, who do you think you are? You're narcissistic. <laughs> but David had a right to say this. There, there are some interesting things in here, and these aren't in my notes. I just want to pick these up. <laughs> Number one, the Lord rewarded him according to his righteousness. David could judge and measure his righteousness by the way that God rewarded him. You know, in business, uh, you know, when I teach the, the, the management classes, in the class I'm teaching right now, there, there's one in there about, you know, asking a corporate about a corporation, are their measurements appropriate to this, you know, to their vision or mi and mission statement? You know, you have a vision and mission statement in the company. And so as they measure their performance, is it appropriate to the vision and mission? And they're supposed to discuss this. And, okay. and you'd be surprised. Many <laughs> students don't catch it. Don't catch it. But we have a vision and we have a mission. And God has given us a mission to do, and we have a vision. Our vision is faith. Now, I don't want to get off on faith too far. <clears throat> there's, there's, two, there's really two definitions or usages of faith. According to Paul in, in, in Hebrews 11, what faith is, is based on two things. It's based on, number one, the evidence. The evidence of our faith. And the other one is our hope. Hope and evidence. Two things. Now hope is not, I hope it happens. We have this, we have this thing you know, about hope. Well, I hope it happens, which means I'd like it to happen if possible. <laughs> but to the Apostle Paul, he was very specific in his writings about hope in the New Testament. Hope was not something that I hope it happens. Hope, our hope, is what's on the other side. It's our reward. He knew there was a reward. That's what his focus was. That's what his vision was. We have a reward. His faith was based on the fact that one day he's going to finish his course, he's going to finish his life, and there's going to be waiting for him a crown of righteousness. That was not an iffy statement. It's there. That was his hope. What's the evidence? Because God said it. There is no greater evidence than God. If God says it, that's it. How can you find any more evidence than the Word of God? The voice of God. You can't. And that's the two things that make up the faith that Paul was talking about in Hebrews chapter 11. It's through faith that Abraham, he, he obtained the promise. He didn't see it, but he obtained it. Why? Because he had faith. He knew that that was there, it was coming from the voice of God, the word of God, therefore it is a reality. That. Now, you know, we use faith, well if I had a little more faith, <clears throat> if I just had a little more faith, I think what we really need to be saying, if I got a little better vision of what I'm looking for, if I stay focused on what I'm doing, it's interesting, Jesus said, you know, if you have faith as a, as a grain of mustard seed, you say to that mountain to move out of the way, what he's saying is, if you have faith, if you're moving that way, that's your vision, and that mountain gets in the way, you can say, get out of the way. Why? Because nothing can hinder you from what God said He's going to do. Makes faith a whole lot more simpler. Our problem isn't the lack of faith, it's having too much unbelief. Anyway. So what David was saying was, <clears throat> God has blessed me and rewarded me because of the level of my righteousness. Okay? If you have a vision, you measure your performance against the vision. You don't measure your performance against anybody else. David may not have had the biggest kingdom in the world. 
That didn't matter. He had the best kingdom in the world because it was God's kingdom. He measured where he was against where God expected him to be, his vision. And so, he kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from the law from my God. Now, wait a minute. <clears throat> uh -huh, David, you remember, you remember that rooftop experience back there? Yeah. Where does that fit into here? Notice it says he didn't wickedly depart. There's a difference between being wicked and falling. Wicked says, I am going to defy God and I'm going to do this in de defiance of what God said. And then there's the other one when you fall, where you sin, not in defiance of God, but simply in, uh, well, I, I know it's wrong, and uh, maybe I forgot. <laughs> you know? there, there's two things there. And so he never wickedly departed from God. In fact, he never really departed from God. He may have sinned, yes. But was that departing from God? Nathan came to him, what did he do? went immediately in the morning in grief. And we've seen David, you know, before, uh, you know, in mourning and grief over Absalom, paying the price for that, for that sin. So he understood he never departed from God. Uh, it's one of those things where, you know, he kind of jumped out of his arms. <laughs> anyway, and I'm not making, I don't want to make light of David's sin, but I'm trying to get you to see there's, you know, a sin is is not as horrendous in the overall picture of things as long as we stay focused on God because we can always pick up the pieces and head on. It's just as sinful and it will take us away from God just as quickly. But it's the secret is how to deal with it and getting back to God as quickly as possible. Because we all sin. I'm sorry. I haven't found anybody that hasn't. And the reason I know that is because I haven't seen anybody float out of here or any place else. And I'm still firmly anchored in the ground, as my wife knows. Alright. Notice this last verse. And I have kept myself, or, or it's actually verse 24. I have kept my, myself from my iniquity. He recognized his iniquity. But he kept himself from that iniquity. Now how does that work? So many people, when they when they do something wrong, the whole rest of their life is exploded right there. They come down to these altars every Sunday morning to repent of the same thing that they repented of for the last two years. They go home and they worry, am I going to make it? Because I did that two years ago. We want to get you involved. Well, I get involved, but I, I, God won't allow me to be involved because I'm a sinner because I did that two years ago. See, David did not allow what he did, his iniquity, to take him down from the place that God had for him. We, we too often want to carry our forgiven sins around, and so we're, we're so busy carrying these burdened sins that we can't work for God. We're not nimble. We're not flexible. We can't do what God wants us to do. David said, God has, He helped me so that I could keep myself from my iniquity. We want God to do it. God said, no, you do it. You keep yourself from the iniquity. You throw it down. You get rid of it. You rely on me and I'll lead and guide you. But I'm not going to just take that iniquity off of you. You have to do that. Because that's where faith comes in. Either God forgave you or He didn't. David practiced six things. Kept the ways of the Lord. Remained true to God. Kept God's judgments before him. 
did not put away God's life or laws, walked uprightly before God, and kept himself from iniquity. And, uh, and of course, because God judged David to be righteous, he rewarded him according to the cleanness, cleanliness that God saw in him. David wrote that beautiful song in which he says, Lord, cleanse me. Wash me with hyssop. Make me white as snow. Cleanliness. Cleanliness. Verse 26. With the merciful you show mercy. I'm sorry. With the merciful you will show yourself merciful. With the blameless man you will show yourself blameless. With the pure you will show yourself pure. And with the devious you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. Hmm. If you show mercy, God's going to show mercy to you. And of course, Jesus used the parables to the servant who, who uh, owed his master money and master showed him mercy, so he went out to the uh, another servant that owed him money and had him throw him in the poorhouse. You know? And so what the master do, he turned around and threw the servant in the poorhouse. You got you, you pay it now or get in the, get out of here. <laughs> he shows mercy if you show mercy. If you're upright, if you're truthful in everything you do, God will be upright and truthful with you. Does that mean if you don't, he won't be truthful and upright? No, it just means he won't be anything. You know, he's not going to he's not going to come out and make promises to you. Because you don't qualify. You're not upright. Pure? He's going to be pure. Uh, I like this one D. With a perverse or wicked man, he shows himself perverse. You say, what are you talking about there? Well, we've seen times in scripture here in, in just in the two books of Samuel where God apparently does things that are contrary to His own law. He has people lie. He has people do things. But they're always to the perverse person. They're to the perverse nation. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. God, you know, and all of these things, of course, today, that's the, the big thing, you know. But God is love. He loves everybody. No matter if you're the worst sinner, God loves you. He does, but not in the sense that they're talking about. Don't worry about it. You're all right. God will not punish you because God is a God of love. Well, I got news for you. To this wicked and perverse generation, He's not going to be a God of love. He's going to be a God of a wicked and perverse generation. They're going to get what they ask for. The very destruction of the battle of Armageddon goes against the very laws of God because he's killing people and destroying people. And, and, and the commandment says, thou shalt not kill. Right? But to those that are perverse, he will be perverse. He will do things that we don't expect God to do. That may shake somebody's theology a little bit. But I can take you through Scripture and show you place after place after place where God did things that were that was we would say, how could He possibly do that? Because He was dealing with perverse men, perverse nations, and even in the church. Remember when Ananias and Sapphira came between for Peter and said, "Oh, we sold everything and gave it to the church." Next thing you know, they picked. Picked him up and hauled him off, and here come his wife, and she said the same thing, and they picked her up and hauled her off. Gone right there. No mercy. Allah is a God of mercy. Alright, enough of that. Notice this last part of this. I love he will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. The humble is on them. <laughs> I mean, you can read that. You can see why well, he doesn't have his eyes on those. But he's not talking about, uh, in, in this sense, uh, of eyes. He's talking here, he's looking for the opportunity to bring them down. With the humble, 
What is he? If the humble, uh, he saves them. And when they're saved, he doesn't have to keep an eye on them to bring them down. He's not going to do that. But he's going to look at the haughty. <clears throat> All right, uh, verse 29. For you are my lamp, O God. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. For you, for by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. So what David's saying is he's the one that sheds a light on my pathway. That lamp shows me where I should go. He enables me to rush with violence against the enemies. The enemy comes against me. I don't have to go power in a corner. I don't have to worry. I can run straight at them with violence because he is my God. He will, he will cause me to run against that troop and give me the strength. I can jump over the wall. It doesn't matter what kind of barrier they put up. No matter how the enemy hides. I can leap over the wall. I can overtake my enemies. How oh, if we could understand that? That's what God wants us to do today. We're not out in swords fighting. But the enemy comes against us. It says he raises up a standard against them. That's the flag. That's the, the banner. He puts that out there. But we have to be the soldiers. We need to put on our, our, our armor and go out to battle. Because he will give us the strength to go against our enemies, to overcome our enemies. And if they put themselves in a fortress, to jump over the wall. We still have that. God still wants to give us that. Um, since His way is perfect, He is a shield or, a, or a, uh, a protection to all that trust in Him. Only God is Jehovah. <laughs> he is perfect. The Word of the Lord is perfect. And He's the only God. He is our only protection. Alright, who is God? Verse 32. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power. And He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. And He sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Now what is David asking? David asks, who is God? Who is the ruler and the judge? Who is that? Except Now, this, you know, we look at that and we say, well, that kind of makes sense. But when you look at it from the minds of the men in that day, you remember, we've, we've talked about it several times, that the heathen around them, all those nations, uh, they believed in, in, in a tiered divinity. In other words, you had a low-level gods, and these were the ones you put in your house, you know, and, and these were supposed to protect you. And these gods were the one that gave you fertility or whatever that particular god was supposed to do. And you kept that in your house. That was your low-level god. That was the one that was protecting you. Then you had another level of god up here. And this would be, for instance, Dagon and some of these others uh, that they worship, Baal and some of these. They had this layer of gods. And then above that, there was this third layer. And this third layer was what they did not understand. It was a, it was a layer that was uh, uh, so vast and so big and it was what empowered these other gods. That's why you remember when Daniel went in the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar when he came out he says, ah, your God is the only God. He wasn't talking about these low level gods. He kept those. <laughs> this is the God that's up here. You know this God. 
we can't reach this God. We can only reach these gods, and maybe if we offer sacrifices and do enough crazy things, we can reach this level. We cannot reach this level God. Remember Paul, when he was on Mars Hill, they had the, the monument to the unknown God. That wasn't just some unknown God in case they, you know, if you're a preacher, well, they did that just in case they didn't know who it was. No, that's this God. The God that's a God of everything, over air, all these other gods, but you can't touch him, you can't talk to him. He doesn't talk to you. He's over these other gods. And that was their concept. That's why these, these nations, you know, when they defeated another nation, they would take their God and put it in their temple. If they worshipped Dagon and they took somebody at Baal, they would put Baal over here, you know, and, and they would collect these gods with the idea that they had more gods then this, all the power from this supernatural high, high strung God up here would go through them and go out and they'd have more power. That's how they, that's how they, that's how they fought in those days. And India, uh, the Hindus have that very same concept of layered gods. Only when they get to the top, they don't have a deity anymore. It's this cosmic something. They can't even describe it. And really, that's probably the best description of God we have. We can't describe him either because at the very top he is a spirit who inhabits something called eternity, neither one of which we can comprehend. But anyway, aside from that. So, what David is saying here is who is God? It's Jehovah. He is not mysterious. I know him. His name is Jehovah. Yahweh. There is no other ruler or judge. There's no rock or foundation upon which you can build except Yahweh, God. He's the only one you can depend on. David recognized that all his strength and power came from God. It was not his military prowess. It was not the skill of his army. But it was the strength of God. Now it says here, he makes my feet like deer feet. Oh, he makes my way perfect. Excuse me. What that's talking about is when the kings went out to battle, there was a group that went in front of them. And they took care of any obstructions that were in the way. Now you think about it, you're moving 100,000, 200,000 troops down dirt roads. They didn't have super highways, tanks, transporters, airplanes, ships, you know. They walked. And they brought donkeys, in case of Israel, to haul their stuff. Or they may even had some camels to haul their stuff. But they had to walk. And so these guys went in front, and they cleaned the roads off. If there was obstacles in the road, they would get rid of them. They'd make sure the roads were wide enough and cleared off so these troops could get down through there. You didn't want to come to a part where you had to go single file with 200,000 soldiers behind you. And when the king went out, and some of the, uh, and we read about it in, in Isaiah, remember some of the pictures in Isaiah uh, where it says, you know, they would go before the Lord and make his ways, his ways straight. They, they had regular armies of men that would go out and make sure the king had an absolute smooth ride. They would repair the roads if they needed to. So, so it was a long, arduous task to prepare for the king to move anywhere. Well, that's what David is alluding to here. Instead of having men out in front to clear the path and gather the food and make sure everything is there and the camps are set up when we get there. Instead of that, God did that for him. So you start to get a mental picture of what David is referring to. He's a, he's a military guy. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's referring to. He made his feet uh, like, like that of a deer. And the song made his feet like hind's feet, which is a, a female, uh, a doe. But if you know anything about deer, their, their, their hooves are like this, you know. And if you're a male, you got a little thing that hangs down in the back called a duplo. And I know in the years I used to hunt, we'd, we'd track deer all the time. We had a lot of deer. we tracked the deer, and you could tell whether it was a doe or, a, or if it was a, a buck. And you see these things, and you could tell by how deep it went in the ground, how heavy, how big the buck was, or how far apart his, his, his claws were, or his, his uh, feet. And, but you watch those things go up a rocky cliff almost, and they go right up there, never miss a step. I mean, right up that hill. Because those feet dig into the dirt and into the rock and give you a firm foundation. 
And that's what David's talking about. Remember, he spent a good part of his time running for Saul in the mountains, in the rocky places. He said, you've made my feet like deer's feet. I don't slip. I can run quickly. I'm fast. Remember the time when David, when Saul thought he had him hemmed in and he had everybody around him and he was cornered and, and David went over the mountain was on the other side of the mountain. And Saul's over here had him all hemmed in. He'd already gone over the mountain and was on the other side escaping. David praised God for his ability to fight and to bend the bull made of brass in order to string it. One place it says the bow of iron in the, in the King James. New King James says brass. It would be a brass bow. They didn't have the iron. They didn't make their bowls and, and out of iron. But they would take that brass bow and they would step on it and pull it and then be able to string it. Well, I know I've talked to archers and I've seen archers with these big bows. And that's one of the things you can't do very easily. You've got to be a, a strong man to pull that thing down far enough to get the string over it to string it. That's what he's talking about here. Alright, verse 36. You also gave me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. David acknowledged that God had provided him a shield of protection the favor and the goodness and the kindness of God is what had made him great. It wasn't his abilities at war. It certainly was not his ability to be king. Uh, you know, uh, you know, as a as a leader, uh, I can go through and pick out all the stuff he did wrong. He made all kinds of mistakes as a leader in appointing men. In you know. Uh, as a man, he, he made all kinds of mistakes. But it was God that overlooked those and, and, and showed kindness on him and made him great. If it wasn't for God, he would have been defeated. And God showed, uh, treated him kindly in not holding his sin against him. You know, we repent today and his sin goes away. They didn't have repentance in those days, really. There wasn't that option. But God in His loving kindness did not hold it against Him. Now, there, there's, some, there's some theories out there or uh, parts of theology that say David's sin was never forgiven until the cross. And I certainly can see that. Because there was no salvation in the sacrifice of sins, of, of bulls and ox for sins. They merely rolled them ahead for, for a season. So God would not hold them against them. But on the cross, God took all of their sins. The sin of David, the sins of Saul, the sins of all of them that had come and offered the sacrifices for their sins. And he washed them away with his blood at Calvary. What a tremendous load he bore. All right. Verse 38. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back until they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise up. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked but there was none to save. Even the Lord, but He did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in my streets. And I spread them out. <laughs> Boy, this is really a, a, pumping his chest here pretty good on these, isn't it? But what David meant was he was able to pursue his enemies without ever being driven back. He never had to retreat. He didn't have to turn back. Saul had to turn back from some of his battles. David never did. He was able to overcome them. He was able to defeat them. He gave, he gave, God gave David a complete victory over his enemies so that they were not able to rise up again. You say, well, what about the Philistines? 
Oh, they have little skirmishes like we saw, city to city to city. But they never again put their mass army together and came marching into Israel and defied God and, and Israel and David and everybody else said, we're going to destroy you. They never were able to do it again after David wiped them out. Only small skirmishes to try to take back some of their cities. Now, this is an interesting statement. He says, David's enemies cried for help, but there was none to help them. The Philistines evidently sent out help. Why well, need help from the Amorites or the or the Edomites or the or any, anybody come help us? Nobody would help them because God would not allow them to come and help. And notice it says here, and they even called out to God, out to Jehovah. Who would do that? That would have been Absalom, Ishbosheth, perhaps Saul. God would not help them. Why? Because they were violating His will, His word. Verse 44, You have also delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. Now this refers to, of course, uh, the uprisings in Israel from Ishbosheth and Absalom. And he still ended up as king. Now the surrounding nations were put uh, under tribute to Israel. This would be Felicia, Moab, Syria, Edom, according to 2 Samuel 8. And other nations were, would submit to him when they hear the voice of David. Uh, they would say, <laughs> I think we better just sign the peace treaty right here before we get in any further into this. But they also considered, uh, this is also considered a, a uh, uh, prophetic statement concerning the Messiah's conquering of the Gentiles. Uh, I should have mentioned this way back, but uh, much of David's writing is considered to be prophetic. He was a prophet. And he knew, because of the promises of God, that the Messiah would be from his house, from his lineage. Samuel told him that. And he knew that his kingship would be for everlasting. And he's going to mention that again here in a few minutes. So David had an understanding of what his house, what his lineage was going to be. Okay? And so much, and, and, and of course being a prophet, much of his... Uh, of his uh, psalms have some, well, not much, but several of his psalms have prophetic meaning to them as well as uh, actual. And of course, as you know, prophecy has a, a, a current and then it has a long, a short range and a long range uh, when they prophesied, the pro all the prophets, almost all of them had that. So what we're seeing here uh, is this considered a, a statement concerning the Messiah's conquering of the Gentiles. Uh, David, he says, um, where am I? Oh, over here. Hmm. No, I don't know where to go. Oh, I think I'm in, I jumped ahead of, no, I'm, did I jump ahead of myself here? Yeah, oh no, I'm alright, I'm sorry. I'm, I get confused. The mind's going slowly. Uh, it says up here, the foreigners uh, submit to me. Above that, a people I have not known shall serve me. Uh, as far as we know, David didn't have anybody that served him, particularly under his reign. Now, he put a lot of them under tribute, you know, other nations, and they, they sent tax, paid their taxes, and so forth. But we don't know of any of them that actually served him or joined into his, uh, under him. There was proselyte Jews, things like that. But, but, and certainly if they did, he would know who they were. But this is somebody he doesn't know that's going to, that's going to serve him. And the Bible says, of course, uh, you read it in, uh, a little bit in Revelation, but most of it is, is over in Isaiah uh, and the minor prophets where we see that Messiah sets up his kingdom. And it says, and every knee shall bow. That doesn't mean they're all going to just love him and come right in. It means the bow, they are conquered. They will serve him, 
whether they want to or not, isn't going to be the issue. He comes as Messiah. So again, this is a prophetic verse. talks about that. Messiah will be the head of all nations um, when he sets up his kingdom. Oh boy, we're, I'm leaving a lot of this out of here. So, uh, oh, one thing I want to jump back to verse 43. Uh, this is kind of hard to, uh, uh, this may be misunderstood. He says, Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets and I spread them out. What he's referring to here is the fact that he so utterly destroyed their armies that like dust they fled away, or like dust on the wind. Uh, the actual, um, when you read it in the, uh, not the Torah necessarily, but some of the, the rabbinic uh, commentaries on this, what this phrase is referring to is dust as it's being blown in the wind. So in other words, he so completely destroyed the armies and, and disrupted them that they fled. They retreated just like dust, just flying away with the wind. And that's, it doesn't mean that he got them in the streets and jumped up and down on them and smacked them up so he cut them in little pieces. I've heard some preachers say that. That's why I want to make sure that was there. All right, verse 47. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king. He shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants, Forever. Evermore. Hmm? Evermore. Evermore. Forevermore. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Means the same. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, this pretty much is, is a summary of what he has said all the way through. Uh, that the Lord lives. He is my rock. Blessed be him. He is my rock. <laughs> he has. He is the one that needs to be exalted. Uh, David exalts Jehovah, who is the living God, as opposed to the inanimate idols of the heathen. He is the foundation and source of his salvation. It's God who needs to be praised, not David. Not David. Uh, it was God who avenged the actions of Saul. Uh, and he had, he had subdued all the people under him. And God gave, gave David the victories over his enemies and lifted him up above all that opposed him. He delivered him from the violence and sure destruction from Saul, whom uh, uh, for honor's sake he does not name. He doesn't say in here, uh, you have delivered me from the violent man. The violent man is obviously Saul. But because he honors him, he was the anointed one. He would not utter his name. That's that's even though he did all the terrible things to David that he did, David refused to dishonor him in any way. David's reason for writing this psalm is so that it would be used to give thanks among the nations and to sing praises to his name. Verse 50. Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. Another prophetic statement. One of the reasons for writing this was so the song would be sung among the Gentiles. Wow. Wow. Powerful stuff. Finally, David ends his song by declaring that God is the tower or fortress of salvation to the king that he anointed, that God anointed, and shows mercy to. That would be David. He then extends that salvation, that salvation to his descendants forevermore. An allusion to the Messiah that will be from the lineage of David. Not bad. I did it in an hour and a half.
Any questions? I didn't think I'd make this one two, an hour and a half. I was trying to make All right, next week we have one more lesson, and then we're going to go into Revelation. So again, please, uh, invite anybody to come who wants to.